Well, good afternoon, everybody. It is wonderful to see so many people here during Reading Week. Uh, you're all very, very welcome. I'm Lorraine Leeson. I'm Associate Dean for Research, and I'm also very, very much a big fan of Tris. So thank you to Tris before we begin for being our partner in this and for supporting this idea to have a conversation about open data. And that conversation sits very firmly within the broader scope of work we've been doing for the past 18 months with the Unboxing Open Scholarship Task Force. I'm not going to take up any more time telling you about that because we have the people who really can say it in the most eloquent manner who are going to come up and tell you more. Uh, so without further ado, I welcome our Dean of Research and our library. OK, uh, who's saying not me? Our wonderful, wonderful librarian, Helen Shenton. Helen. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, a very, very warm welcome to this. Um, the Dean of Research and I have been leading a, uh, a cross-university task force for the last year or so, and one of the major outputs has been this year of events under the umbrella of, of, um, of uh, Unboxing Open Scholarship. And we've just, um, doing a review, it's about, we've realised about 900 people have come to these events. It's very noticeable how different each of the audiences are, <clears throat> and so you're all very, very welcome. Um, and we've looked at everything from um, um, uh, open data um, uh, and data management plans and open education uh, to different forms of uh, publishing to we launched um, uh, under Shane Collins Soapbox, which is an open access student publication, so that's actually doing it. So they've been very, very varied. Um, the idea is to be very interactive. Um, we take um, note of the issues each time, and those then inform the, the future uh, uh, topics. We're very much guided by uh, the LIRU um, open, uh, um, Roadmap to Open Science, which um, it's the Dean and I who um, fed into um, LIRU and said, we felt it should be open scholarship. It's the term we use here because it's wider, um, and the open science is used in the European sense of scientia, the Latin for knowledge, um, but we find that open scholarship is a much more inclusive um, uh, term. Um, so you're very, very welcome. We have some other events before uh, we wrap up the year of um, unboxing open scholarship, and the Dean of Research is just going to acknowledge the fabulous colleagues who have done all the work. So thank you ever so much. Thank you. I, I just have a tiny few things to say. Um, I'm delighted there's so many people here as well. Uh, w when we look at the open scholarship things, we depend on people as well to come forward and bring different perspectives to us. And it was through Catherine actually that made us think about qualitative, uh, qualitative data as well as quantitative data, which you know kind of is the normal place that you start so i think opening up the conversation this way is really really important and we're delighted and thank you for putting all of this together uh, thanks again to tris to mave and ronan uh, for all of the work that they've done in helping us and um, the panel lorraine you might be introducing the panel but we have uh, we have so we have nia brennan who's going to be on it our, our resident open scholarship expert who will discuss fair data principles uh, and we also have aileen o'carroll the policy manager for the irish qualitative data archive Aileen, there you are. And we have Jenny O'Neill, data manager for the Irish Social uh, Science Data Archive. So I think it's great to have people with such experience of, of managing data archives to, to be here to discuss it. Um, and then I'm also told to remind everybody that there will be lunch outside afterwards, that if you feel like sticking around and having lunch and, and having a chat. So, so thanks a million to everyone again for coming here and for putting this together. And I'll hand over then to Lorraine and the panel. I have an easy job. I'm simply going to introduce names, sit down, and then drag them off the stage when their 10 minutes are up. So without further ado, and with that warning lingering, um, I am delighted to welcome Neve Brennan from our library, um, who's going to talk about Towards a Fair World. Neve, over to you. Thanks very much, Lorraine. And I'm glad you said it's Towards a Fair World, and it's not that we're going to do a fair world right now, because that's probably not going to be possible just right now. I'm going to put myself in a timer here and find where my thing is, Catherine. Thanks a million. So towards a fair world, and um, thanks very much for, to Tris for inviting me to, to come to this to talk to you about it. This is the tip of the iceberg here. So fair research data, fair data, 
many people take it as open by default and that's what it's described as and that causes a lot of people to worry i'm here to try and make you not so worried about that right so FAIR, as you probably know, stands for findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. And those things sound as if they might either be very obscure or else very obvious. We'll have a quick look at them, but I'm going to say this a couple of times. If you need any help or want to go into this in any more detail, please call me along too and I'll come and talk to you individually or collectively about this, especially if you're trying to work on a plan at the, at the moment for managing your data. So we all know that you're juggling and, and trying to cycle a high wire at the same time and it's really difficult to do all these things how can you be expected to do this stuff as well about managing data including the data that needs to be stewarded managing the ethical sites and so on so it is a high wire act and it is something that there are concerns about ethical issues Lorraine is the expert in this whole area and um, particularly in your areas so let's go and have a look at, at this anyway and see why are we doing this? A lot of people say, as if we don't have enough to do, where is it coming from? Well, it's coming from funders in the main. Starting, there's Carlos Mojas, who was the um, Director General of um, of DG Research in the European Commission in 2017 when they launched the uh, Amsterdam Declaration saying that um, they want to open by default all scientific data produced in future projects under Horizon uh, 2020 and that's uh, moved forward into Horizon Europe to ensure the scientific community can reuse the enormous amount of data that they generate. So um, and he came out with that but he also came out with the statement that helps us in a little way which I will talk to you about in a moment. This is what the grant agreement looks like for and it, it requires since January 2017. Right, so we're talking about three years ago and we had plenty of notice for this before this in all of the universities in Ireland. And I'm going to ask you later on, do you think that you've got the support that you need to be able to do this, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, but what's required is, and many of you will have some experience of this, hands up anyone who's filled out, a, who's completed a proposal for Horizon Europe recently, yeah, or Horizon 2020, so you know that there's a, there's a part of that that asks you, how are you going to manage your data? And it asks you for specific things in relation to it, what kind of data are you going to produce, what kind of standards are you going to use, how are you going to share it and make it available for verification and reuse? And if you can't, explain why. How are you going to curate it and preserve it? Most people who come along to me go, look, I have to do the research. How can I be expected to do that? And what the hell is metadata? A lot of people say, right? So they, well, there's help at hand in all of these areas. If and when you're successful in your Horizon 2020 project, then you have to complete a full initial data management plan six months after the project begins, a mid-term one if it's long enough for that, and a final data management plan after that. So there's a structure put on this, and it's a very specific kind of one. It looks really daunting when you start off, but I think, I mean, Catherine is going to tell us about her experience. When you get stuck into it, a lot of this sort of thing hopefully makes sense. So. Research funders in Europe, and Spark Europe has just brought out a, recent, a new report on this area, is the funders policies, and these are mostly um, UK and European Commission, but you can look at the funders all around Europe in the Spark Europe report, and you'll see that pretty much all of the funders in Europe have now got some policies in relation to this, um, not least, um, not, not only in other countries, but in Ireland. We have been slow. We're one of the slowest countries in Europe to get up to speed in this area. Which means that you might think, gosh, that's great. It's not great because we're at a competitive disadvantage in relation to this. Data are research outputs. They are research outputs that are citable and that they can push citations to your publications. They can gen engender partnerships and collaborations and all kinds of good things. They're really important for citizen science and for civic engagement, not least, and as I said, and particularly to do with the SDGs and so on, which I'll hopefully touch on in a minute if Lorraine doesn't drag me off the stage in the meantime. So Science Europe, the umbrella body of all this, the uh, science funders in, in Europe, and when I say science, of course you know that I'm talking in European terms, it's Wissenschaft and it's, it's knowledge, it's not science. So this includes all the funders in Europe and they came up with a template and a practical guide to the alignment of research data management. So this is where it all comes from. We're going to circulate these slides after, I think, so that you'll be able to spend loads, waste loads of time looking up um, the, the links and so on. And in Ireland, of course, we have the national framework, the North framework for the transition to an open research environment. 
In the centre of that, and completely aligned with the European policy, is enabling fair research data. Now, we're at the stage in, in Ireland where the Dean of Research and the Librarian are sitting on the North Committee at the moment. They'll be able to inform you, maybe at another session, about where we are and where we're, where we're going in relation to the national policy and the national action plan around this. It might sound threatening. This is really the research community looking for an infrastructure and a fund, funding to support us. That's what it's about. We're trying to get the government to face up to their commitments in Europe in relation to this and build an infrastructure that will support us for storage, for preservation of our data, keeping it safe even if it's not open, and giving you help in the form of people, data managers, stewards if you need them, people who can support you to keep your data secure if you need to and to look after it. That's what all this is about, really. That's the subtext, because at the moment, we don't have any resources. We have no resources in the country, and we have no resources here in Trinity, I have to say. We do a lot of talking about open scholarship, but in the end of the day, when it comes down to it, we're very tight when it comes to those resources. So I just thought a little bit of a reality check there I wanted to, um, to do on that. So enabling fair data looks for exactly the same things as the European one, and it says data management planning is required as a standard practice from the earliest stage in the process. So, um, and they look for a data management plan and it says, as open as possible, as closed as necessary. And this is what Carlos Motis came up with. That is the thing that, that's our get out of jail card. We don't have to make our data available. And there's lots of reasons that we can give commercial interest. We're not finished with the project. It could be years before we finish it. All kinds of reasons why we wouldn't do it. But if we can do it, we should do it. That's the, that's the thinking behind it. The HRB has just, um, in January, has come up with their data management plan, and you'll find that in the DMP online. And I've got a bunch of tools and resources that you can check later on and, or come to talk to me about. The DMP online is your template. It's like a wizard for writing data management plans, and there's loads of help and support on that. So the HRB is the first Irish funder to do that, but we're expecting that the others are going to follow and do something very similar. So it's worth having a look at it. So basically, keep an eye on this again. The, for fair research data, it's findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. At the beginning of your research, as you know, and throughout the development of your work, you're going to be creating and managing data. It can be in any form, so images, text, audio, all that stuff you do on in vivo and everything like that, your field studies, your spreadsheets, everything, lists, it's data, and it's valuable. And the funders want it to be looked after and kept and be accessible, maybe not by the public but somehow or other be minded. So, so it's not sitting on, but I always have a USB stick and I can't find the name of the file somewhere or other. You know, that's, that's pretty classic and it's not just me, I know that. The data can be qualitative or quantitative. It doesn't have to be big data. Generally, it's small data. It's just sitting on CSV forms or spreadsheets or something like that. And everybody at every career stage needs to know how to make their data more fair at this point. Findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable via the FAIR principles. They're needed for the reasons that I've mentioned already. And I'll leave you with this slide because I think I've already talked about it. But data need to be created with longevity in mind. It is, there is a, and maybe Lorraine will tell us a bit about this, there is a, you know, an issue with the ethics and where data had to be destroyed up until recently. And I know a lot of you will be very familiar with that. You want, to, you know, if possible, to provide other researchers with access to your data, which facilitates knowledge discovery and improves transparency, reproducibility, the validation of your work. And a lot of publishers, as you know, are requiring this uh, for, um, for publications. Um, and they tell us how they should be organized. It sounds as if it's something very new, but a data management guru who was employed by the Longroom Hub, by um, Paul Holmes' um, project there, the ERC project, said, it's not, it's nothing different. It's just basic project management. That's all it is, in, in a particular way, with the framework. It's a set of principles, FAIR is a set of principles, not a standard, and it doesn't mean, again, I'll repeat that it has to be, the data have to be shared with everyone. It can be FAIR and not open. Open data might not be FAIR, and so on. So, what I'm going to do, because I'm coming to the end of the time, just to remind you that open access is as open as possible, as restricted as necessary. And we have a list and can give you boilerplate text to put into your project um, proposals if you want to put them in. And we can fill out a lot of the forms for you in that. We've got a checklist to say how fair are your data. We don't have time to go into that now, but it's just a checklist. What are you doing? It's, and it's just checking those boxes. And that boils it all down to a single page of questions. 
There's a bunch of tools and resources that are available. The DMP online, the library web pages, and we've got links there to that, that provides you with interest, um, interesting information about it. Not least one that I should mention, don't forget to put in the cost of your data management on your project proposal. The terrible stories come to me about people who've got big international projects and they can't they have forgotten to put in the costs. The costs of data management are allowable in, for most of the funders there. That means people, if your project is big enough, our software, our hardware, some kind of kit that you need for it. IT services have a whole lot of information on the security levels, the risks around data. Here's the link. You can use these pages. They're really good. They're very interactive. And there's lots of help on that there. And of course, we have Tara in-house as our repository. There's an example of some data sets in Tara. There's retreedata.org, which is a registry of trusted research repositories. <laughs> She's going. Um, some of whom are represented here, ISTA and uh, DRI, Zenodo and others. Amnesia is for anonymization. It's a free tool that you can use for that. And don't forget what fair data is all about. It's about impact, right? It's about the impact of data. It's about linking to publications, using altmetric scores, and so on. It fits in precisely into the area that we're working in with research informatics in the university, linking your publications, your data, open access, altmetrics, and trying to maximize your research impact. So rather, try and think about it that way, and, and don't forget that research data sets are included in the arts, humanities, and social sciences uh, research productive metrics, which I'm now going around at college collecting at the moment for reporting into college, and 20% of the budget of every school is based on this metric. So include your data sets, put them into the research support system, and put them into Tara, and put an embargo on them for 900 years if you want to do that. And link them to the US Sustainable Development Goals while you're at it, why not? And make yourself look really good. And uh, we have gender and civic engagement in there as well. We have training available in this area on the, the big six. Um, so we integrate data management with the whole gamut of research scholarship. But there's one thing, this was mentioned by the librarian earlier on, that bringing about change in universities, and this is a change, requires leadership and vision, a mix of targeted measures to achieve cultural change, transparency, accountability and monitoring, and above all, trust and confidence in a shared vision. And that issue of trust is really important. Open scholarship can't exist in your traditional world of bureaucracy, the autocratic style of exclusive information, the antediluvian management styles of non-collaboration and non-discussion, um, where they're closed and rigid and unresponsive and in inward looking. What we need to move to is an open organization with transparency, inclusivity, adaptability, collaboration and community. If we're to teach values and to use them ourselves, we need to espouse them as an organization, as a college, as a university. This is not just something that you add on to the rest of to your projects and to your things. This is a way of life, it's a culture, and it affects the way that we behave with one another in our organizational structures and our behavior as well. Trust in an organization requires benevolence, integrity, and congruence. We need to line these things up. As Madeleine Albright said, there's a special place in hell for women who do not support other women. And right next door to it, there's a special place in hell for people who espouse open scholarship values and openness and don't practice them. Thank you very much. <laughs> don't let me forget my, um, Thank you my so memory much. stick. Thank you. Thank you so much, Neith. I always learn something new every time I hear you talk. So. Thank you so much for, for sharing that body of information with us. I'd be certainly looking forward to seeing your slides and checking out some of those tools that you've mentioned. Our next speaker is the wonderful Catherine Collin, who is going to talk to us about data in need of a home. Catherine, over to you. Thanks. So I'm in danger of being in either open data hell or open data purgatory after this. So we'll see how, what... Um, because I'm definitely in the process of working through where I stand on open data and what I can do with my own data. So um, I'm in the School of Social Policy here, and um, I, um, uh, you know, I've been involved in a, in a lot of policy commission research in particular. Um, but I'm particularly exercised by what I consider my career-defining research data sets, which are data sets that I've collected 
since 1990, mid-90s, um, so uh, quite a long time now, um, on Irish women's access to abortion care. So in 1995 and 96, I was involved in a Department of Health Commission study where we travelled to England and met with Irish women who were in abortion clinics there um, and using uh, the abortion services there. That was a study where we interviewed qualitative interviews with 100 Irish women having abortions in England and another 300 women who are pregnant in Ireland. So an enormous body of data reflecting the 90s in Ireland when the Department of Health thought, unless you collect a lot of them, those interviews won't mean anything. Um, by 2004, I was commissioned again to do a study for the crisis pregnancy programme um, on who by then had put in place support services for women in Ireland who wanted to access abortion services in Britain and they wanted to see how women were engaging with those services. So again, we travelled to Britain and I interviewed um, 50 women in Britain who were uh, attending abortion clinics for abortion care there. Um, by then there was an acceptance that 50 interviews would do instead of 100, um, so that was helpful. And then at the moment, so we know repeal happened in 2018 and Ireland now has an abortion service uh, domestically and the, uh, crisis, the sexual health and crisis pregnancy programme have commissioned me to do a piece of research that is ongoing um, with Irish women using the abortion care services in Ireland. So it's, I have the kind of metadata reference there called UNPACT, so it's the Unplanned Pregnancy and Abortion Care Study. Um, <clears throat> so to kind of move across those, um, I see the Women in Pregnancy study, that study from the 90s um, of Irish women seeking abortion, is very much a legacy data set. It was a data set that was collected at a time when there wasn't a requirement um, uh, to uh, destroy under the ethics that it received. Um, the PI on that study was Evelyn Mahan. I was a research assistant, but Evelyn very generously has given me um, custodianship of that data set. And it resides in a um, Kath Kidston baby suitcase in multiple formats. So the, you know, this is, I had uh, you know the, uh, the images of bringing it in, but there are hard, uh, floppy, hard floppy disks, CD-ROMs, and there are uh, some untranscribed um, tape formats as well. So um, the well, in the consent forms for that study, there was no provision for depositing the data. And uh, there is scope to archive it, which Neve has helpfully explained how I can move it out of the suitcase and into a safe, secure deposit place in its current form. So I could be really um, restrictive or conservative and just give you that data set that you mind for me there. Alternatively, I could curate that data set better and do much better data stewardship on it and move it from all of those multiple formats that we still don't even know. I kind of think of it as data evaporating. I don't know if all of those CDs, when I click on them, will actually open the interviews. So it's, it's kind of scary territory. But I have an option to data steward them, but I do need a lot of resources to do that. So the data stewarding is currently a mess and a lot of work and a lot of time and a lot of care and attention. And I do believe I can rebuild that data set, but I do need some uh, certainly guidance and resources to do that. The 2004 to 2006 interview data set is a kind of a happier story. Um, it is still, I would consider, a legacy data set. Um, there was no provision for deposit in that data, certainly on open access on the consent form. Um, there is scope to archive it now because I understand how archiving can work. It is better data stewarded. It's on an external hard drive and it's in .txt format. So it's much more, I know it's there, it's less um, scary. Um, the 2019 data set, which I'm currently collecting, it does have provision for depositing the uh, data in the consent form, but in the form of, you know, within the plethora of things women have to tick to consent to the interview, it's one line that says, I consent to this interview being deposited for further analysis. And I'm not sure if that actually amounts to those women consenting to me depositing that data in the Irish Qualitative Data Archive for open access. So that's the red question mark. Um, I do have provision for archiving. It's funded by the, um, a, an agency of the Department of Health. They do not have a budget for data management, so I am putting in place, I did 
develop a data management plan that adheres to fair principles for this project, and I am implementing that data management practice. But again, that's kind of the uncosted, invisible work that we have to do under the commitment to fair principles. So that's about having those data sets. To me, there's huge potential for me to make that the rest of my career, essentially, of research, for sure. There is a scope for that. Um, so I need to really work at, through this. But I'm thinking about data stewarding, right, and this notion of how open am I to open scholarship. So I'm definitely open to data stewarding. I want that data to be minded. I want it to be carefully minded. I want it to be safe, secure, and deposited so I can reuse it and I can access it. In terms of the ethics of consent, did women sign up to me reusing it? I firmly believe they did. Uh, the statements that women would make within the interviews say things like, I want uh, you know, the Department of Health to know what it means to do this journey or what, you know, various statements. So that, uh, that ethic of consent is there. Is there consent to archive? And I'm not sure. I mean, I think there's, there's, there is consent to archive and securely for closed access to me. Um, but I really need to uh, consider the ethics of archiving. And in, in that, I'm thinking, what did women consent to? That's really important. But then I also have to think about the value of those narratives socially and culturally to our, our state, our society, our understanding of, of women's lives, our understanding of our social world, our understanding of Irish culture. It has huge value beyond what it did in the first instance. Also, there was women's commitment to contribute to knowledge. That is an ethic that I must um, engage with. Um, there are the resources entailed in generating that data. All of this data has been generated by me from state-funded research. And that research entailed an enormous amount of resources to generate it. And do we let that data evaporate in the click of a delete? I really have real issues with that um, in terms of the, the, the value, the, the cost it took, the resources it, it took to generate it. And then I believe there's an inherent legacy in that data that's that goes beyond my capacity to analyse and engage with it. People with other epistemological perspectives, other ontological perspectives, other disciplinary perspectives will make other things of that data than I can make of it. And that's another ethic that I have to engage with. So that's the things that I, um, you know, that are keeping me in purgatory, I guess. And then I have to think about um, what I hear about how open my field is to open scholarship. And there's a lot of the same things being, you know, discussed. There's the idea of, oh, you know, do I hand over my hard-earned data? And there's almost an idea, protect your data or perish. Um, so, you know, but then I ask myself, but is it my data? I don't think it's my data. Um, then there's the argument of, you know, you, you know, you exhaust it and everything's seen in it. Well, I don't believe that. Or the idea that data dates, you know, that the 95 data has nothing to say anymore. I don't believe that. I think data has relevance beyond the time that it's collected in. Um, it certainly is capable of moving from social science into history, for example, so it can become relevant there. Um, then there's the idea of the constructivist argument. You know, is the data a product of the interaction between the researcher and the research participant? And does it, it has no meaning beyond the context that it's collected. Um, and I don't subscribe to that. I am, you know, I have moved through iterations of constructivism and, you know, all sorts of various um, belief systems, but I've now left that fully, not fully, but partially behind. Um, so I've now got to the point that, of feeling that you know, data has mutability, it has plasticity. So I brought my data uh, that I collected with my data, data that I collected with women who conceal pregnancy, into a collaboration with a music composer, and she produced an opera from that. That data had huge portability and huge mutability. And so, you know, why wouldn't it move out of my field into other fields and have potential relevance there? Um, so there's, I guess, when I hear your arguments, Neve, around fair principles, and you know, you saying that um, you know at least we should keep data safe, if not make it open. I think those of us in the social sciences who are engaging with all of those questions should think, well, at least make your data capable of being open, and have an incremental approach to thinking about how you will engage with openness as you move through your 
evolving kind of mindsets. Um, and that, yeah, I, I can uh, make peace with the idea of as open as possible, but as closed as necessary. And then just the last thing I think we need to think about, you know, um, with the idea of qualitative data, that the move and the impetus for openness is not to make qualitative data big data. As, as you kind of referred to Neve, that the idea that we're, that we're scaling, that open data will allow us to scale up and we'll get big data and we'll have big data for qualitative paradigm. Well, you know, really interesting uh, kind of event at, at Maynooth University last week said, you know, it's not big data for qualitative methods, it's uh, qualitative methods for big data or, you know, keeping small data sets in place through open scholarship processes. So there's an awful lot more to think about when we're thinking about our qualitative paradigm with this. So that's as much as, as far as I've got, I guess, Buzz. So thank you for that. Thank you so much, Catherine. I hate to have to tell people to stop talking because there's so much really interesting I, so many interesting ideas and great things that we will come back to and have time to talk about uh, as a group. But before we get to that point, can I also welcome um, Aileen O'Carroll. So we're going to do this as a panel, but perhaps we'll give Aileen the floor first. Yeah? Um, Aileen O'Carroll from the Irish Qualitative Data Archive and Digital Repository of Ireland. Over to you. Uh, hello, I'm just going to give you a quick introduction to the Digital Repository of Ireland and then the Irish Qualitative Data Archive and talk about the connections of the two and um, ways in which possibly we can help you. I'm going to end with qualitative data and some suggestions about how uh, researchers can make their data open. Um, so what is the DRI? DRI is a national data infrastructure. It archives digital data, particularly focusing on humanities, social science art, um, and arts data. Um, its, its main mandate is, to, um, is the long-term digital preservation of data and to aid access and recovery. So uh, digital data is, as Catherine is finding out, much more fragile than, um, than uh, material, um, uh, non-digital data. So like the Book of Kells is over a thousand years took a digital photograph of the Book of Gels, uh, it could degrade within five years. Bit rot, it's called. Um, so, and, and, and that is a, it's much more complicated to preserve and make accessible uh, digital data over, um, over time. When people think about archiving, um, I always say, you know, you're not talking about five years, ten years, you're talking about a hundred years, you're talking about two hundred years. So will your data set be accessible well after you've, 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 you've passed on? Um, so uh, it's, a, it's a consortium between three universities, the Royal, uh, um, Trinity College Dublin, Maynooth University and the Royal Irish Acad Academy. Um, so the, uh, it's a membership organisation, so the way you access it if you want to deposit data is if, you're, or if your institution is a member of DRI, and Trinity is a member of DRI, Arlene Healy um, uh, from the library here sits on our management board. And the um, software infrastructure that underpins DRI is provided by software developers based in Trinity, Catherine Cassidy and Stuart K Kenny. So what we do is we actually uh, take your digital data and we ensure that it is going to be preserved for the long term, for the 100 years, and that, that we, will, we have processes to ensure that you've got ac accurate backup and storage and that we check on formats so they don't go out of date. Um, I have a similar project to Catherine where um, I ended up with you know, these square floppies and I couldn't access data. And actually in that case I was saying to Catherine, I actually ended up going back to printouts that were 20 years old and rescanning them because they were saved but the digital was lost. The other thing that uh, we do is we put all these uh, data sets um, in a repository where you can cross across the institutions and cross the data sets. And we think that's one of the great advantages of depositing data within a, a repository like DRI is that it allows people to find your data and also to build connections between data sets that are there already. Uh, so we're a certified trusted digital repository. Uh, this is just a quick picture of what, what it looks like and so, some of our, um, our collections. 
Um, but this here we're interested in looking in particular at research data and uh, data we fair. So I'm going to skip on this. People talk about why you should be fair. The push, the stick is research funding. But I think there's other reasons for, doing, for making your data deposited in the archive. It increases the visibility of your research. It allows you to create um, uh, new collaborations and exchange and networks. I think a great example of that is the growing up in Ireland data set that's deposited. Uh, the qualitative data is in uh, the Irish Qualitative Data Archive and the quant is in ISTA that Jenny's going to talk about. By depositing those data in the archive, they have encouraged other users to use that data and they've generated a community of use which has really developed the whole field of scholarship in, the, in that area. Um, so I think if you don't uh, uh, um, deposit your data or look at open science, you have a, a risk of um, decreasing, decreasing exposure of you as your researcher and your research field. So how does DRI fit into this? Uh, we're the national infrastructure for archiving, preserving and sharing research data and we're very much involved in uh, the emerging policy landscape for open science. So at the moment, we're hiring a national open research coordinator that's going to drive the, the next phase of implement the open science policy. Um, and we're involved in the NORF that's been mentioned earlier. So the research data cycle, you create, document, share, and use. And you hopefully it's, it, it's fair. So within DRI, I don't know if I'm, this is always dangerous, clicking on something. Um, oh, actually, I have it here. So if you deposit your data in DRI, it, it, it ends up in the repository. This is via a, the computer. It may also be used in publications, exhibitions, or broadcasts. Is this okay? Bye. Right. Now we can. Okay. So that's just somebody uh, at the beginning of an interview. Somebody's uh, reading the consent form for International Women's Day. I picked this interview. It's from a project that looked at Irish women um, in work, um, and they uh, think I think it's. It's from Cork, and they deposit the, the, the data afterwards. So you see the data is there. This has got particular consents that allow it to be open. Here you can see uh, there's a citation which people will use, what cites the authors, and also has a DOI which allows people to find this data over time, which is, uh, meet, also meets your FAIR requirements. And this, this here is the catalogue record, which is essentially the metadata that's attached attached to it. Uh, okay, so there we are, back to, oops, uh, sorry, back to the slides. Okay, so I'm not going to talk a little too much about data management mm -hmm. plans, but the end of the plan is what do you do when you finish the research and how do you make sure that you can protect and store your data for the long term. I just put this slide in because we've got a link to a DRI data management plan that has got um, an awful lot of resources that will help you uh, fill in your own, your own plan when you're looking at these issues. Like my role as a policy manager, what DRI does is it advises on things that uh, are important in terms of picking correct formats that are, will allow reuse over, over time. So uh, metadata, sharing is caring about your metadata. The, the big importance of metadata for me is that it allows you to share your, your, your data set uh, with other researchers. Uh, the problem with the digital world is how do you find things? And metadata is how you ensure that your data set is, is findable by other researchers and also how you can have links between different types of data sets. Um, so yeah, so I've already looked at this. This is the this again. This is the meta that that that, that that's attached to it. This is what it looks like in the back end. This is XML. Um, you, you you you. This is how the computer reads it. This is how other people can find it. This is all a particular standard called Dublin Core. We've got guides on how to use it. I advise you to try and use a, 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 an international standard when collecting metadata rather than just uh, creating your own. Uh, and because we would like people to do that, because it makes archiving much easier in the long term, we've created this uh, um, template. It's just a, a spreadsheet which you can use yourselves when you're creating your data sets. And um, as your project goes, as you create your files, you make sure that you add in what the title is, who created it, a little bit of description and rights. And again, uh, if Catherine had done that and if I had done that in the 90s, it would make it so much easier for us to understand what 
all those files are, you know, when you end up on your files and they're called, you know, final project one. Uh, okay, two minutes. So um, the IQ Day that I also work in is uh, a me also a member of DRI. Our main o focus is social science qualitative data, so oral histories, uh, interview transcripts, etc. So I just want to finish with um, talking a little bit about the challenge we have in qualitative data in making our data open. So we have 13 collections that are available for access in DRI. And five are available for open access, either all or in part, um, and eight, the access is restricted. And in general, the tradition in the social sciences is, is to, uh, to try and restrict data. So these ones are open data. You've got the essays from, uh, of, from children, and you've got this um, beautiful oral history from Mary Muldowney, who's a historian who's based in Trinity, on women's experience in war. These ones are restricted. They're only available for researchers who uh, are involved in um, uh, academic research, research projects. So, but they do, because they're available in an archive and they're available in some level, they do meet the responsibilities for uh, open data. So one thing I would say that, as Catherine also mentioned the same point, as open as possible, as close as necessary. When you're thinking about as close as necessary, Think about strategies you can use to make some, if not all, of your data set open. So the life history and social change data, we have consent forms, and some people want to be anonymized, and some people don't, and some people want their data to want to be public, and some people don't. So what we did is we have the whole collection is restricted for research use, but for those people who did give consent, we've got small clips available that can be used in the classroom or to uh, sh uh, show people about the data. So I would say, say when you are doing your data management plans, think about consent. Think about, you know, you, you know it's traditionally we ask, do you want to be identified or not, anonymous or not? Always make sure you ask a question, can you archive? And when you're archi asking the question in archive, think about who should be able to access the data. Is it going to be publicly available or is it just going to be available in a limited way to, to researchers? So you can have a, a gradiated response and some of your data sets you'll be applying some str strategies and others you'll have maybe more, more restricted strategies. So try and do a, a sort of a, an audit of the sensitivity levels of your data set and pick a data management strategy afterwards that's, that's appropriate. And that's me, so I'll deal with the rest in any questions. Thanks very much. Thank you so very much. And our next speaker is Jenny O'Neill from the Irish Social Science Data Archive. And then we're going to come back to you. So get your questions, your thoughts ready. Hi, everyone. My name is Jenny O'Neill. And um, as I've been introduced, I work in the Irish Social Science Data Archive. Um, like Aileen, I wear a couple of different hats. So half of my job is managing and running ISDA. The other half of my job is providing data management services for UCD and for the campus in UCD um, for researchers there, where I deal with a lot of people who are writing data management plans. So I'm kind of coming at this from both points of view of, of the archiving at the end of the project, but also planning for that at the very beginning. So ISDA is Ireland's leading centre for quantitative data acquisition, preservation and dissemination. So what this really means is that we take the quantitative data that you may be producing, um, we acquire that, we have a data uh, collection policy that suggests what we would like to collect and keep in the, in the collection. We preserve it, so we have a lot of different technical um, things and aspects that we put in place to make sure that the data are properly preserved and managed. And we also disseminate them to other researchers. So like Aileen was talking about in terms of restricted access, all of the data in our archive are restricted. So they're not completely open, you have to apply for access to them, and all of those applications are reviewed on a case-by-case -case basis. All of our data are fully anonymized, so we only hold the anonymized uh, microdata files, the AMFs, um, for researchers to access, but we still apply um, restricted access, so data sets can either be requested for research purpose, based on a specific project, or for teaching purposes, depending on the wishes of the depositor. So we aim to be a central access point for quantitative data within Ireland. 
um, with the idea of making those data sets more widely available. So when we're talking about making data sets available, we're thinking about research integrity and reproducibility. So can we reproduce um, the results that are in our publications, but then also um, making the data available under the auspices of open science and fair data? Can we make those data available for reuse for secondary analysis? And then we would also like to um, be working a lot more and are working a little bit but hoping to work more in the acquisition of data analysis skills. So supporting researchers in being able to take a secondary data set and having the skills to be able to analyse what, um, what they get. So we have a number of different data sets that are available. Um, this is, number is always increasing. So we have a lot of data from the CSO. We will have uh, make available the anonymised microdata files from several of the studies. The researcher microdata files are available to researchers as well, but it's a much more um, strenuous process that you have to go through and a much stricter process to get access to those. So in most cases, the anonymized version will be sufficient for people. Um, we have data from uh, research groups like ESRI, so Growing Up in Ireland is an example of that. Um, and we also take in data from ma major research projects within the universities as well. Um, so examples of that are Healthy Ireland, the Irish Sports Monitor, and we have the Irish uh, Longitudinal Study on Ageing, which is based in Trinity. Um, so we take data from a lot of different places, we uh, preserve those, and then we make them available to research for reuse. Um, a lot of our studies are one-off studies, so they're just kind of done once and the data are finished with and, and they're made available. So the All-Ireland Traveller Health stu Study is an example of that. Um, we would have some data sets which are repeated cross-sectional data sets, so they are repeated every year or every couple of years, um, which means you can do some kind of longitudinal analysis on um, the country as a whole. Um, and then we also have longitudinal data sets. So this is, these are the same people who are being um, surveyed year after year after year. Um, these are more difficult then for to be anonymized because obviously the more information you have about a person over their lifetime, the, more, the easier it is going to be to identi potentially identify someone, um, which is part of the reason that we would put these restrictions in place, that they're not just available to anyone for any reason. Uh, we are in the process of becoming a member of, the, of CESDA, which is the Consortium for European Social Science Data Archives. Um, CESDA is a European ERIC, which means it's a research, European Research Infrastructure Consortium. Um, so this is going to give us um, access to uh, colleagues across Europe, which will help to, um, to strengthen our infrastructure. And we have a couple of projects in mind already on how we can do that. Um, we'll be able to benefit from European funding as well and from the knowledge and experience of the other social science data archives around Europe. Um, we will also be feeding our data catalogue then into the CESDA data catalogue. Um, so that people will be able to go to the CESDA data catalogue and access um, data sets from across Europe and do cross-national studies as well. So we're very excited about that. We're just waiting for a ministerial sign-off. Um, so who knows how that's going <laughs> Who knows how long that's going to take, but apparently that's all we're waiting for is for the minister to sign something. Uh, we are also Core Trust Seal certified, which means that we are a trusted digital repository. And the Core Trust Seal is a self um, audit, so we went through this process in 2017, I think it was, um, and we received the certification. So that means that you can feel a bit more assured uh, that we know what we're doing. Um, that we are able to look after the file formats that you might be giving us, that we are, have proper preservation practices in place, and that is both social and um, human processes and technical processes in place. Um, and once we have a couple of new projects over the line, we'll be uh, reapplying for the Core Trust Seal. So Core Trust Seal relates to FAIR in some ways. Um, so it's not saying that we are completely a FAIR data repository, but there are a lot of um, linkages between the, uh, what we have to fulfill to be Core Trust Seal certified and FAIR data. So how do we support FAIR data within the social sciences and how do other archives support it? So all of our data are available through a public catalogue. Uh, we make the metadata available and not the actual data sets themselves. Those are restricted. Um, so we support findability. So your data sets are more easily to more easily found because we are publishing metadata about them. Um, we provide a unique identifier for those data sets so that they can be identified. Um, and we also um, 
uh, enhanced those data sets by using a metadata standard called DDI, so that's Data Documentation Initiative, that allows us to document the data sets both at data set level and at individual variable level. So it's an incredibly rich um, metadata standard. And then we also apply a license, so it's very clear to researchers what they can and can't do um, with the data. So that's how we support the fair data principles within ISDA. And if you have any questions or anything, please feel free. If you have data that you think you might like to make available through the archive, uh, send me an email and we'll have a chat. Thank you.